up, Neon Life Church. How y'all doing today? Y'all good? Woo, it's good to be back. It's good to see you guys. Uh, Crystal and I took a, um, two weeks off, and y'all are still here, so I'm so glad. You know, um, our associate pastor, Julian, did a phenomenal job with the Word uh, the first week we were gone, and, and uh, loved that. And, um, and also, and then pastor, um, youth pastor Shelby Eccles last Sunday brought a great, great Word, too, didn't he, everybody? So it was so awesome. And I want to take a minute, just look into the camera, and I say, if... Uh, you're joining us uh, online. I'm so glad that you are along for the ride, and I love seeing your beautiful and awesome faces here today. I got so many, uh, I got a lot of great pictures, you know, from our trip, and we went to, um, we went to uh, um, the Black Hills Mountains in South Dakota and, uh, and went to Mount Rushmore and uh, all those other different places, like right in the area there, and then we went from there we went to uh, Yellowstone National Park, and uh, man, that, that, if you've never been there, I think that's a bucket list place uh, that you need, you need to add uh, to go there, and uh, we, we got to, uh, uh, when we were there, we apparently, um, it's pretty, pretty awesome, we didn't know how, uh, how awesome it was, but uh, we saw 20 wolves when we were there, big old, about 150 yards away, a pack of 20 wolves, everybody, so... Wow, okay, yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so uh, we saw a couple bears. We didn't see a grizzly bear, though. Um, but, however, uh, I have written music while we were there. And uh, you, no, you will not get to hear it unless uh, maybe down the road. But I actually, as I get bored and I start singing songs, and so the animals we were looking for, I would begin to sing songs about that animal. And, uh, and, and they're very catchy, by the way. So... Uh, Anyway, I'm going to work those out and maybe put them into a song. Hopefully, they'll, they'll be available in the National Park um, stores soon. <laughs> so, uh, anyway. Um, wow. Okay, so let's get serious for a second. So, this is, uh, this is, we're kicking off week one of a series that we're calling, that I'm calling Daniel. Um, and, and it's strategic, really, that uh, uh, I put this series here where I put it. Um, and I preached the series back in August called It Is Written About the Word of God because I, I want us we, we've got to be foundationally rooted in, in what is truth, and uh, especially in a culture like we see today. Um, and I believe that the culture that we see today is so similar to what Daniel encount, was encountering in the book of Daniel. Um, you know, it's just a, a man, it's, it just feels like tensions are high, and man, there's just, there's just so much just, you know, just claws are out. And um, it really, the question for this series that I want to address is, is how, how do we as believers, how do we love our world well and also stand for God's truth at the same time? And, and we look at the book of Daniel and we see that Daniel was able to do that. And so we're going to take his story and, and we're going to look at that and we're going to see how we can, 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 and can, we, we can face the culture that we live in today. So just to kind of give you a little history lesson, we've learned it back in the It Is Written series on the book of Daniel um, the Bible, which can kind of be confusing sometimes in the Old Testament, uh, well, the Bible's not in chronological order. Uh, as a matter of fact, when the Bible was put together, they put it together in categories or sections. So you get the very first section of the Bible is, is, is called the Pentateuch or the Law. And so we have the first five books of the Bible. Then you have 12 more books called the Historical Books, where it's just a, bu- it's, it's, it's a bunch of great uh, like historical records of, of God's people. And, and so it's not in chrono- chronological order because then you'll be reading, you'll read the story of, of, of David and Goliath and then you'll jump over into the book of Psalms which is the next category of books, the prophetic, or not the prophetic, but the poetic books and you get like Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Solomon. You'll see some Psalms that David had written even after you thought David may have died because the Bible's not in chronological order. And then you get... The next two categories of books, which is the prophetic books, the major and minor. The major is not any more important. It's just, they're just longer. Well, Daniel, the book of Daniel is placed into one of the, uh, into the major prophetic categories of books. Um, Daniel is, uh, is 12 chapters long. The first six is historical. The second six um, chapters are prophetic. So the book of Daniel, I'm saying all this for a reason, I'll get to it just in one second, but the, um, the book of Daniel could have been placed into the historical category of books. But I believe the reason why it's not there but in the prophetic section is because God wanted us to see something. God wanted us to see what happens to a culture when the culture turns their back on God. I really believe that. I don't think, 
you, you could read the book of Daniel and you, and you could pull a lot of like, that's, that's really great, awesome stories, God. But I believe what God wanted us to do is not just, not just take away that, man, these are just a bunch of awesome stories, but I believe God wanted us to read Daniel for a time like we're encountering right now and walk away from it and say, that's what happens when a culture turns their back on God, when a culture leaves God. And when we read the book of Daniel, we see Daniel and his men, they stand against culture in such a way as to influence culture. It's powerful, everybody. And, and their stance wasn't like what a lot of us um, men naturally want to do is, man, we just want to just take the gloves off and let's just go, man, 12 rounds. Let's rock and roll, man. Let's get it, you know? I, that's not what, yeah, I mean, that's, that's my attitude. I'm like, you, you got something to say? Say it to my face, you know? And, you know. <laughs> but that's not what Daniel, that's not Daniel's approach. <laughs> Y'all want me to do that again, but I ain't doing it again. It'll be on video, though. So. But that's, that wasn't Daniel's approach. Daniel's approach was he, he stood resolute for the, for the word of God. He stood, he stood in his faith, yet he still loved well at the same time. And because of the way um, Daniel approached his culture, culture didn't influence him, but he influenced the culture, which is what we need to do. That God has is, God is called us not, um, not to, uh, God hasn't called us to be right. He's, he's, he's called us to change the world, right? And so we have to influence the culture. But I'm going to tell you, never in the history of the world has screaming and hollering and yelling and insulting ever changed anybody. Although that's what we might want to do. That's, you know, we want to blast people out on social media. Look, I'm telling you, I'm, 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 I'm. I have a tough time with that, man. I see people post things on social media. I'm like, you want to know something? I'll tell you something right now. I'll say this and that. And that's what I want to do. But the Holy Spirit's like, uh-uh, oh, that's not going to do anything. Never in the history of mankind has insults and, and, and aggression ever changed anybody. But Daniel approached his culture in a way that did influence the culture. So, uh, so how do we do that? So I want to I walk through. I want to show you some things. This is really probably, um, it's a, I think it's a very um, simple word for us to get today, but it's a very powerful one at the same time. And so what I want to do is I want to walk through the first chapter of the book of Daniel with you guys, and I want to show you some things that are very, um, very interesting um, that, that I believe are very interesting. So let's look at Daniel chapter 1, um, beginning with verse 1. Through seven, it says, "In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonians came to Jerusalem and besieged it." So, right then and there, that's whenever the, the the Hebrew people were put into exile. They were enslaved by the Babylonian Empire for seventy years. We've heard about that in the Bible, where the Hebrew people were um, in exile for seventy years. They were enslaved by the Babylonians, and the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the Babylonian um, king's hands. Along with, now grab hold of this, because I want you to see this, um, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. So not only did um, King Nebuchadnezzar um, enslave God's people, because the, God's people turned their back on God, but he also took away their holy things. He stole the holy things from them as well, and it says, these he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then <laughs> the king ordered this guy named Ashpenaz. I want you to remember that name because he's all throughout. He's a key figure in this, um, in this story. Um, the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility. So what they were doing is they said, we need to have, um, talk about the Babylonians, we need to have a voice for us to, back to the Hebrew people. So what, we want, what we're going to do is we're going to get these Hebrew people that have what we believe have great influence, and we're going to bring them in, and we're going to change them so that they can influence their people. Now, I want you to remember that. And so um, these, these were young men, Without any physical defects, they were handsome, kind of like your pastor. I'm supposed to laugh that hard, okay. Showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. 
So their goal was to change them, right? Uh, and then he, talk about Ashpenaz, was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. Now notice this simple statement that comes next. It seems so innocent, which is the way culture works. Here it is. It says, the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. That's so innocent. But that's how culture influences you. That when you're not grounded in the word of God and you're not grounded in the truth, then culture will easily move you. When culture shifts, it will easily move you. Because that simple statement of they're going to have to be required to eat the king's food actually required them to go against their faith and their godly and their religious beliefs. And so whenever the king is saying, you need to do this, such a simple thing, it's not a big deal, actually required them to go against their faith and their belief because these were actually, this was actually food that was sacrificed to idols and Daniel and his men who had a, a faith in God could not touch that, that kind of stuff. And that's why it's very important, by the way, why we are involved, why, that's why it's important that you're here. That's why it's important you're involved in a body of Christ. When you, why, that's why you need to come to church. Because you need life spoken into you. That's why it's important that you get in a life group. So you have people walking together. You have, you're connected with people. Um, you're protected by people. You're growing together in your faith. That's why it's important that you go to Growth Track, everybody. Because we look you in the eye and we say, the, it's not the world's identity that you need to take on your, to your life. It's God's identity. God has a purpose for you. We, look, we talk to you about that. We tell you the purpose God has for you. That's why it's important you get into the Word of God and you ground your life in the Word of God. Don't ground your life in, in, in what I tell you. Don't ground your life. Well, Pastor Eric said, well, it doesn't matter what I say. If it goes against the Word of God, don't listen to me. Listen to the Word, right? So it's important that you ground yourself in the Word of God so that whenever culture shifts and culture moves, you have grounded yourselves in the things of God, in the people of God, in, 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 in the life of who God is, in the, in the life of God's people. And so when culture shifts, you've got people there to hold you accountable, hold in the, in the word of God to hold you there in place. And so they made this statement, you're going to eat from the king's table and you're going to eat the king's food. And, and, and that goes against their religious beliefs. And, and so they were to be trained for three years. And after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among these were some from Judah. Now, here's some of the names of the, of the men that they brought in to, to influence so they could in, turn around and influence their people. One of them we recognize, his name is named Daniel. The other three, we know their names by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But here's their Hebrew God-given names. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are their God-given names. The chief official, talk about Ashpenaz, he decided, I'm going to give them brand new names. He said, I'm going, to get, I'm going to give you new names. God has given you a name, but I'm going to give you new names. Can I tell you something? That a lot of us have taken on an identity and a label from this world that is not yours. God has an identity for you. God has a name for you. And you need to listen to what God says about you and not what the world says about you. I think that, that boils down to strongholds and and. Things that were said to you throughout the course of your life and you have believed what the, what the enemy, what the devil has spoken over you. And it's not, that is, can I tell you something? I'm looking now and tell you that's not who you are. That's not who you are. You're not, you're not an addict. You're not insecure. You're not less than. You're not, you're not, you're not any of those things, but you're who God says you are. And if you want to know who God says that you are, get into his word. Read it. It's powerful. I mean, you'll, you'll read all throughout the Bible what God says about you and, and what, how God thinks about you and how much God loves you. But, the, but they're going to give them brand new names. And to Daniel, they're going to give the name Belteshazzar. And to Hananiah, they're going to give the name Shadrach. And to Mishael, they're going to give the name Meshach. And to Azariah, they're going to give the name Abednego. So they're going to change their name. So I want to give you three things that culture is going to try to do. And this leads to my very first point is culture first is going to try to rename you. Culture is going to try to rename you. Culture is going to try to put a, the, the devil himself. I'm just, I'm just going to point straight at this guy. The enemy himself is going to put a label on you that is not yours. Let me just say it this way. God has a name for you. You're going to listen to the name that, that, the, that, that the world has for you, the name that God has for you. What are you going to listen to? 
Listen to this. I want, I want, to, I want to illustrate this very thing of, of what, uh, uh, look at this. Daniel's name means God is my judge. Like I listen to God and God alone. I don't care about the voice of, of culture or what the world says. God, what do you say? God is my judge. They gave him the name Belteshazzar. Think about this. Lady, protect the king. Let that sink in for just a second. God, I listen to you and you alone. They gave him the name Belteshazzar, which means lady, protect the king. I believe the greatest assault that we're seeing in our world today is on gender right now. I believe the greatest attack that the enemy has in our world today is on gender. Gender identity. And it's com- just like, just like the, um, these men were, were, were so simplistic- some simplistically asked to eat this food from the king's table. It's such a simple thing. But I believe that the attack right now is on, is on just gender identity. You know, and it's coming in such simple ways. I mean, I, can, I, can I just get, you know... Um, and this is not in my notes, but, but we see it in simple things like um, Nickelodeon. We, we see it coming from simple places like Walt Disney. Look, I'm not trying to dog them. Look, I, I, wanna, I, I like Disney World, everybody. I, I enjoy going there. So I'm just, saying, I'm just saying, parents, you are the filter for your children. And, 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 and the, the devil, all he's trying to do, all he's trying to do is rob you from the identity that, that, that God has given you. And I want to tell you, there's, there's only two genders, everybody. There's male and female. And I'm not even a scientist, and I can, I can, I can, I can, I can prove that if I need to. <laughs> but there are. I, I Googled it last night. I didn't want to, but I Googled how many genders are there. I didn't even know how, like, how many genders are there. And there was, there was multiple lists. I mean, I saw anyone from 60 to 600 or something like that, and and, 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 and there's such an identity crisis because what the, what the enemy is trying to do is the enemy is trying to steal, kill, and destroy and distort you from the true identity that God has put on you long ago. And if he can do that, if the enemy can keep you from the identity that God has for you, then he can keep you from the purpose and fulfillment that God truly has for you. I, I, and I want you to know, if this is something, if this is a struggle in your life, I want you to first of all know there's no condemnation here. I love you. God loves you. And I want you to know that God has an identity for you. And all you have to do is pursue that to discover what that is. Here's the next, here's the next name right here. Um, it's Hananiah, which means Yahweh is gracious. Which is just, oh, what an amazing God I serve. God, you're so incredible. God, you're so amazing. They gave the name Shadrach. I'm afraid of God. The devil doesn't just want to uh, attack your identity. The devil wants to steal your faith. He wants to mess up your faith as, as, as well. Uh, Mishael, it's who is what God is. Look at that confidence there. Like, there is no one like our God. They gave the name Meshach. I am despised, contemptible, and humiliated. I went from confidence to cowardice. I think this is one of the biggest issues that we see amongst Christians right here. That, that just, just an just a, just a insecurity and a... And a in a head hanging low, in a fear of, of, just, of, just, of just everything. Let me, let, me, let me tell you something. We don't serve a God of fear. We serve a God who, who's called you to be bold. Let me, can I just speak life into you? If that's you and, you and you're dealing with this level of insecurity, and I, I think we all have it. Like, you know, I, I'm going to tell you right now, it makes me nervous as everything to step up on this stage every single Sunday. But I know who my God is, and, I'm, and, and I know what God says about me. So let me speak some life into you. Let me actually speak the word of God in, into your life. Deuteronomy chapter 28 actually says if you, if you will surrender your life to God, then God will bless every single area of your life. He will bless you whether you're in the city or in the country. He will bless you wherever you live. He'll bless you whether you're coming or whether you're going. He says to you that you will no longer be the tail, but you will be the head. You will no longer be beneath, but you will be above. Amen. You know what Proverbs 28 and 1 says? I love this verse of Scripture. It says the righteous are as bold as a lion. Uh, Psalm, oh, I, can't, I can't remember this one. 
But I want to jump over to Hebrews, no, Hebrews, Romans 8 and 31 says God is for you and not against you. Romans 8 and 37 says we are made more than conquerors through him who loves us. Uh, Philippians 4, 13, we all know that one right there, that I can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives me strength. 1 John 4 and 4 says he, is, he, is, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Amen, everybody. God has an identity for you. I'm going to tell you right now, like, like my life, uh, my parents were here in the first service, and, and, and y'all, I, I even was looking right at them when I was telling this story because they can validate uh, everything I was saying. But whenever I was, whenever I was younger, my, my freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, my whole high school career, y'all, I was, I was a mess, everybody. I, I'm going to tell you, um, um, like, probably, I mean, just, let me just say I was a mess, you know, and and my mom's just, she can ver- verify that. And, but I was also so insecure, getting into trouble all the time. I mean, stealing stuff, doing everything, whatever. I had no morals. I had, I had no respect for anybody. I mean, it was just, it, I was just, man, I, I just had no, I was um, just living that kind of life. And, and either, I just think it's hilarious. I think God is either just a, um, just a, a just a wonderful comedian, or he's a redeemer of persons, because the last thing you would ever expect is this right here, is, is God saying, Eric, you know what, you're the perfect person to pastor this church in Weatherford for this time right here. Like, either God has just, is just got a great sense of humor, or he is a redeemer of persons, everybody. Can I, can I get a good amen for that? And I want to tell you something, God has a label for you, and it's not the one the world has put on you. So we got to listen less to the world and, and listen more to God. Listen to um, this next name, Azariah. Yahweh has helped me. Like, man, God, you just go before me. Like, you just, you just guide me. You lead me. Uh, they gave the name Abednego, servant of Nebo. No, you're not that. God doesn't go before you. No, you're a slave. You're a slave. And through, and through all of this, I want you to notice how Daniel responds to this. Because most of us, you're going to change my name? I don't think so. You're going to make me eat that food? Ah! Uh! But look how Daniel responds. I like this. Daniel 1 and 8. It says, Daniel resolved. Just means he was steadfast and resolute. I like that. It says, Daniel resolved not to defile himself. I'm not going to go against you, God. God, you're all I have. You're you're my truth. You're my life. God, I will lay my life down for you before I move. God, I'm resolved not to defile myself with the royal food and wine. And here's how he responded. He asked. Well, I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to ask if I can. No. No, Daniel said, I'm going to stand true to God. And it says he asked. He asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. I, this is something I, I, I didn't even share this in the first service. But there's something very powerful about stepping back and letting God step ahead of you. And I, I actually um, was, was um, talking to a friend of mine. He, he was um, on staff at a church and he just got let go, and it's just, you know, bad situation. And I called him yesterday and just encouraged him. And I just said, hey, man, I love you. And um, I want you to know that I'm with you, and I love you. And, and I reminded him that all throughout the Bible we see this. And, uh, but there's times where God says, I want you to go fight, and I'm going to go with you. And then there's times where God says, you stay right here. I'll be right back. I'm going to go fight your fight for you, but I need you to stand behind me and let me go and fight this for you. And in this situation with Daniel, this was one of those situations where where Daniel knew. He knew who his God was and what his God is capable of. And Daniel knew that in all my strength and all my wisdom and all my ability, if I go and try to fight this fight, I will not win. But Daniel knew who God is. And so all Daniel knew to do was just step back and say, God, you take the lead. 
God, you take the lead. I, I, that, is, that is such a beautiful illustration of how, of how God works in our life and in the, in the places in our life. And you've got to know what God's telling you to do. If it's, if it's a fight that God says, no, I need you to go into this, but I'm going to go with you, or no, I'm, I'm going to go before you, I just need you to shut your mouth. I don't need you blasting people out on social media and, and fighting behind it. Well, my God's coming for you, and he's going to get you, and he's, uh, he's mad, you know. There's times where you just, you just zip it and say, God, I trust you, and you let God go before, before you in the fight. And so he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. And this is really how I believe culture will try to influence you is because culture presents you with a different way of doing things that looks so very innocent and so very simple, yet it defiles your faith. And it causes the line of what God's truth is and what God's standard is to be moved just a little bit more. The devil has been moving the line since, since the beginning of time, everybody. Every single day. He's had, he's had, a couple, he's had thousands, several thousands of years of just moving the line every single day. Well, it's okay. It's not a big deal. God's okay with that. Man, times have changed a little bit. You know, hey, come on, get up with, get up with the times. And pretty soon before you know it, we've given more and more ground to, to, to culture. But there has to be a point where we stand like, like Daniel stood and he, he stands resolved not to defile himself. But God, I'm standing. I'm standing for you, God. I remember that um, when Crystal and I were in Charlottesville, Virginia, we spent uh, a couple years there doing uh, youth ministry. And there was a, there was a kid there uh, high school student. He wore a Christian shirt. I, I don't know what the shirt said, but he wore a, just a, just representing his faith, you know, um, shirt to school. And one of the school officials came to him and said, "You need to turn that shirt inside out." And I gotta tell you, I was I was proud of the young man because he refused. He said, "I'm not turning my shirt inside out." Good for you. I think that's I think that's great. Um, but he got expelled from school. The school decided we're going to expel you because you can't, you can't wear that shirt in our school. Well, the family came back, sued the school. Uh, family won. Kid was able to return back to school, um, which I think, I think is great, a great testimony that, that the, the young man did what he did. But I felt like in that situation that the damage was done, you know, that the school caved in and, and let that happen. And then it gave the enemy a foothold. Now you had kids coming to school. It's like, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm just going to make it, I'm not going to represent my faith because, man, what, if that's what happened to him, you know, I don't want to put my family through that. I don't want to, I don't want to do, I don't want to go through that. So I'll just, I just won't wear, I just won't express my faith any longer. And that's how the enemy works. The enemy works in subtleties like that. The enemy works in, in simplicities like that. Taking just a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more ground from our faith. Here's, here's, here's the next thing because it, that culture will try to do. is culture will try to tame you. First it's going to try to rename you. And then culture will try to tame you. That culture wants nothing more than to dilute your faith and separate you from God. And look at this, Daniel 1, uh, chapter 9 through 12 says... Uh, now, God had caused the, the official Ashpenaz to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official now told Daniel, he said, Hey, I'm afraid of my lord, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, who has assigned you your food and drink, but you're not drinking it, you're not eating it. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you, Daniel, you're not eating Daniel then said that the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, he said this. He said, please test your servants for 10 days. And if there's one thing in the book of Daniel that stands out to me, it's that the, there's like this theme of testing going on. Like the culture is constantly testing Daniel and his men. We see it all throughout the book of Daniel. And let me just, let me just pass you for a second. I want to encourage you uh, in your faith. But if you call yourself a follower of Christ... Uh, you're going to be tested, everybody. 
That's not very encouraging. Can you, can you be more positive, Pastor? Yep, I'm positive. You're going to get tested. And I don't believe that God is the one that puts the, 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 the tribulation and the testing on you. But I believe God is there with you in the testing. Like we see all throughout the book of Daniel, he's shutting the mouths of lions. He's keeping the fire from even burning you to the point you don't even smell like smoke. And so, yeah, you're going to be tested. Anytime culture shifts, your faith, every time, when culture shifts, especially like we're seeing in culture today, your faith is going to get tested. Your faith is going to get tested. Culture will try to take your convictions and change them. Every single time. When culture shifts, it's going to try to take your convictions with it and change your convictions every single time. But Malachi chapter 3 says that if you, will, if you will go through the testing, that you will come out refined and strengthened like pure silver, everybody. Can I get an amen for that? Man, there's something, there's something really great about the testing. I just want to tell you something like, like I, know, I know it's like, we don't want to be tested. I know that. I understand that. Like, it's not no fun. Man, pastor said, I'm going to get tested today. And, and I can I feel it in the room. I can feel like, man, I don't want to be tested. I don't like to be tested. But you will be refined. You will be made better than you were before you were. Uh, here's, the, here's the next thing. Because in the end, so culture is going to try to rename you. It's going to try to tame you. And then culture is going to try to claim you. Doesn't just want to give you a new name, a new identity. Doesn't just want to rob you of your identity. Doesn't just want to separate you from your faith. But culture literally wants, wants, to, wants to separate you completely from God. All the way. And there's really, um, there's, no better, there's no better way to illustrate this. I got a picture I want you guys to put up there on the screen. This right here is what a, is what a follower of Christ, a believer, a Christian is right here. That although culture is moving and culture is, is pounding against you, that's you. That's what a Christian is right there. And if you do not have your life anchored, if your life is not anchored in truth, absolute truth, then when culture shifts, you'll move. And check it out you won't even know you moved. If your faith is not anchored in truth, when culture shifts, you will move and you won't even know you moved. You just got moved by culture. So what is absolute truth? Is it what you think? Is it what I think? Is it, is it um, what the, the TV pastor or whatever, you know, or on the radio is saying? No, it's the word of God. If you want to know what absolute truth is, I, that's what I love about the Word of God, is although culture may be saying this, I can, I can find out what truth really is. It's right there in the Word. Every single time, I can ground my life in the Word of God, in the Bible, and I can discover, God, what do you say about this? God, what do you say about that? And I can read what absolute truth is, and therefore, when culture shifts, I can stand like that, and it's effortless to stand. It's effortless to stand. And I can still be a light to the world in the midst of culture shifting and pounding against you. Um, Matthew 24 and 35 says, heaven and earth's going to pass away. Culture's going to move. Culture's going to shift. But my words, they'll never pass away. They'll never shift. Now look at what happened with Daniel, um, Azariah, uh, Mishael, and Hananiah. Look at the result of them being tested. Watch this, Daniel 1, 15 through 20. says, at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. They looked better than the people that followed the culture. They trusted God. So the guard took away their choice food and wine, and um, they were to drink, and gave them vegetables instead. I would have been like, you know, hey, bring me a... Uh, bring me a ribeye and some bread and some mashed potatoes. They got, they got the vegetables instead. Um, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds in literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all. Look how God's just blessing them. 
And at the end of that time, set by the king to bring them into service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service, and every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better. Wow. Then all the culture, all the all the, 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 the other ideologists and the magicians and the enchanters in the entire kingdom, he found their wisdom ten times better. Culture didn't influence them, but they influenced culture. Man, because they made a decision not to defile themselves. So I think the best question is, okay, well, well how? How do we do that in a culture that is, that is just pounding against us, how do we stand like they, like, how do we stand like them? Well, the book of John says that Jesus came and he dwelt among us and he came to be two things. He came to be, here's the answer, both grace and truth. Jesus came to be both grace and truth. So if we want to stand against, against culture, if we want to influence the culture, we influence the culture by both grace and and truth. Grace says this. Grace says that we all need a savior. Every single one of us is messed up. We all need freedom. But truth says there's only one way to that freedom and his name is Jesus Christ. If we just have truth and we have zero grace, well truth just says, well I don't care what you say, I'm right, you're wrong, hell's hot. Right? Well God didn't call us to be right, he called us to be light. But if we just have all grace and we have no truth, well, then all grace would just say, well, God's okay with anything. And then at the expense of truth, we have an entire generation now of Christians that are forsaking the truth of God for all this grace of God. Well, just go and live how you want to live. God's okay with whatever you do. And then we've forsaken all the truth of God. It's the grace that we so desperately need, but the truth is what sets us free. So it's grace and truth. There's a story that, that we all know, and usually I would tell this story, but I'm going to actually, I want to read it to you. Um, it's in the book of John, chapter 8, verse 1. It's the woman who was caught in adultery. Listen to this. And I want to share this because this illustrates it perfectly. It says, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered and he sat down and he taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, they brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. Which, like, why, why were they even at the place where she was caught in the act of adultery in the first place? The Pharisees and religious leaders, what were they doing there in the place where she was caught in the act? Of adultery. It's funny how we're so good at everybody else's sin, but we're not so good at our own, right? Something to chew on right there. And it says, they put her in front of the crowd and teach her, they said, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. And you know what the Bible says, that the law of Moses says that she has to die. We have to stone her. She has to die. And then they ask this question to Jesus. What do you say? Well, that's the question, right? How do you respond? They look at Jesus and say, well, what do you say about it? They were trying to trap him, yeah. And so does Jesus go at it with, with, with all truth and now she has to die? Or does Jesus approach it with all grace and forsake the truth of God? And I want to tell you, it's not either or, everybody. It's both. It's grace and truth. I think the church, I, I, think, I think the church has historically messed this up. I really do. I'm just going to be honest with you. I think that you see, you see a church that's just all, you know, grace, grace, grace. It's okay. You're okay. God's okay with that. And then, and then at the expense of truth. And then you've got churches that are all just... Turn or burn, you're going straight to hell. You don't get that stuff straightened out. And there's no grace. 
I want you just to envision this, this, this scene of this woman that has been brought to Jesus. She's humiliated. She's caught in the act of adultery, and she's humiliated. And Jesus is there, and they bring Jesus in. Like, get over here. Tell, tell us what you say about this woman right here. And they're, they're pointing, they're accusing. They're, they're, she, I, I see this woman like on her knees in the middle of this crowd with all of them stones in hand and Jesus knelt down beside her with his arm around her. It's how I picture this scene. What a powerful message that we have. And then Jesus did something that we all have no idea what he did. He stooped down and he starts to doodle something in the sand with his finger. We don't know what he was doing. I think he was just, I think he was, I think he was given time for these, 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 these men to think a little bit. I think he was, he knew what he was about to say. But he's just down there, he's drawing happy faces. He's giving them time. Like, boys, you have no idea who you're messing with. you got time to think about it. And then they kept demanding an answer. So Jesus, he stood up and he said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And then one by one, they began to drop. Then he stooped down. He didn't drop their stones yet. And then he stooped down, he starts to rot in the dirt again. You know what I like to think he was rotting in the dirt? I think he might have been rotting the names of, of, of their mistresses. Sarah. Tanya. And then one by one, they start from the oldest, they start to drop the stones and leave the scene where it only left her and Jesus. You know what I think is beautiful about this story? Is the dignity that Jesus brought back to this woman. So much dignity. That's how Jesus approaches our sin. I need you to hear that. Jesus isn't out to humiliate you and embarrass you. And point and accuse and look at you. No, Jesus is out to restore your dignity that the devil has robbed from you long ago because of that sin. And I see a scene where Jesus is just, man, just wrapped up with this woman and just, I've got you. And restoring her and freeing her in this very moment and giving her her dignity and her life back. And he asked her this question. He said, where are your accusers now? Didn't any one of them stay to condemn you? And she said, no. And Jesus said this, this powerful statement. He said, neither do I condemn you. And he said, go and sin no more. He offered truth and grace. He said, neither do I condemn you. That's grace. And he said, don't, he said, now go and sin no longer. And that's truth. Jesus loved her just the way she was. That's grace. But too much to let her stay that way. And that's truth. In Neon Life Church, I'm calling you. I'm calling you as the body of Christ. That in a world that's, that's, that's so lost, that's so broken, that's longing for answers, that's needing a Savior, I'm calling for you to be light and hope. I'm calling you for, to do two things. It's the first, hold to God's truth, unwavering. This is going to be a church where we stand on the truth of God. Not forsaking the truth for the, for the benefits of what culture wants us to do, but we will stand resolute for the truth of God. Amen, everybody? But also, we're going to freely give God's grace away and we're going to love everybody. Amen? It's grace and truth. It's grace and truth. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come down here. I want to I just do something. Prayer team, and when you get down here, I don't know if you guys know it, but when the prayer team is down here, um, they're actually praying over you in this moment while they're down here. And so I, I, want, us, I want us to pray. Um, I want to pray over you guys. I want you to know that whatever it is that you, you have believed about yourself, that the world or, or you know, the label has been put on you, it's not who you are. That's not who you are. 
I pray that you receive the name that God has given you. In Jesus' name right now, I pray, Heavenly Father, that every person in this room today, God would hear your voice. Holy Spirit, I pray break, break through the hardened hearts today, God. The insecurities, Lord. Break through the things that have been said long ago. Even those on the playground or at, at home, maybe by a parent, God, that was lost as well. Break through all those things, God, and the label that we have carried for so long, Jesus. And I pray, Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, that we begin to hear your thoughts that you think about us, your words that you say about us, the name that you have put on us in Jesus' name, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Literally, God, when you formed us in our mother's womb, all of hell shook because we are fearfully and wonderfully made, Jesus. I pray that we receive that today in Jesus' name. We receive that today in Jesus' name name every person every head bowed every eye closed if you don't know Jesus today then today is your day if you're trying to if you're trying to move through life and go through life and and, and you're lost or you're broken or you're hurting or you know you need a savior right now you want G, you want to just say Jesus count me into that eternal life then I say right now with some boldness lift up your hand and let him see it in Jesus name and let's just believe right now He's a redeemer, everybody. Let's pray this prayer. Jesus, forgive me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for setting me free, God. God, you're all about chances, oh God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you went to the grave and you came out redeemed. And you redeemed me in my life, God. I receive that today. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Come on, church, can we stand to our feet? Come on, give us some praise first, yeah. Come on, stand to your feet. If you made a decision today in your faith, um, I invite you to fill out that connection card. Drop it in the offering box on your way out. We'd love you to help you take a step in your faith. Come on, let's move forward in our faith, everybody. Let's take steps. We've got a prayer team up here in the front. We'd love to pray with you. We're going to worship for just a moment. If you need prayer for any reason, Come on down. We'd love to pray over you. Come on. Let's sing it out. Every voice. Come on.